There is more here than I understand. Which is, I guess, true of all people at all times of their life. We never see the big picture, even when we think we do. We see a reconstruction of the big picture, from the bits and pieces we've picked up and tried to put into the right order. And I have a lot of bits and pieces. Bay and Creek, a vast organization run and financed by, who? The Thistlemen, which are what? And are allied with the US government somehow. And now this person in a hoodie, and over and over this name. Praxis. When the big picture gets too hazy, it's time to return to the details you're sure about. I've been to a Bay and Creek base. For some reason, they let me leave. It's time to go back. And this time, I am not leaving. Performed by Jessica Nicole. Produced by Disparition. Part 2, Chapter 8. Absent Family. Thank you to Audible for supporting our show. When this episode is over, get yourself a free audiobook. Get that free audiobook with a 30-day trial by going to audible.com slash dead. And thank you to Blue Apron for its support. Get three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash dead. And stay tuned after our show when I will tell you a knock-knock joke. There was the farmhouse as I had left it. By all appearances, a shell of what had once sheltered people. A family who staked their lives on the health of the fields, only to be undone by age or disease, or those same fields, or a desire to move on and try something else. Or, more probably, never a family. Every broken plank of wood, every sagging wall, a reconstruction, a fake. I went inside, moving quickly so that I could not be stopped before getting to the entrance. It was late afternoon. There was no use waiting until nightfall. Certainly my approach would be seen. There was no sneaking into this place. I was going to face them directly and force them to deal with me one way or another. Except I wasn't going to even be able to do that. Because turning the dial on the stove did nothing. No pitch down into darkness and back into underground light. Looking more closely, there was a layer of real dust upon the painted-on dust. The dial was clean of fingerprints, except my own, recently applied. The base had vanished. But no. What I had seen had been voluminous, a massive space with hundreds or thousands of people inside of it. There was no way that a base that big was moved or abandoned, not over one person. Even with all the money in the world, that would be ludicrous. But this particular entrance had been sealed off. And how could I find another entrance when it could be a a dying tree at the edge of a creek a half mile from here, or a certain stone left innocuously by the highway? Instead, I dwelled on the more pressing question, there in that dusty kitchen that had once been an elevator. To seal off an entrance like this that had been so elaborately set up was still a phenomenal waste of time and money. It would have made so much more sense to just kill me. So why didn't they kill me? 
There is an undeniable romance to travel, and there is a stranger, more specific romance to traveling constantly. Rootlessness can be attractive. It really can be. The map it creates in your head. When someone brings up Oklahoma City, or Boise, or Chicago, or Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Maine, and for each of those, you have a memory. Being able to think, oh yeah, I've been there. You remember how it felt in a personal way. How Oklahoma City was surprising because it was more hip than I expected. How Chicago in the summer feels happy in a way many other cities don't. The exact smell of an antique store in a small town in Texas. Direct knowledge of the world is a fundamentally seductive thing to acquire. I sat on a faded green couch, covered in dust and pollen, hoping that nothing was currently living inside of it, and I tried to think through why I was alive. Why am I alive? It's a basic question that a lot of people have asked, but my angle was different, more focused. Why am I alive now, in this moment, when Bay and Creek should have changed that whole situation for me in a big way? Possibility one is that they do not kill innocents. A firm moral stance. They are fighting on the side of good. But I don't buy it. That base I saw was massive. Their operation runs, at the least, nationwide. There is no way to hide a secret that large if you're not willing to kill to keep it. If they had a firm code of never killing innocents, then that secret long ago would have slipped. Which leaves me with the other possibility. That they wanted me to see and then walk away alive with that knowledge. A personal memory of what it was like to be inside their halls. But why? They are at war. If they want something, it would be because it helps them in this war. So I can only conclude that I have a role to play in this conflict. That Bay and Creek knows what that role is and I don't. And in order to guide me toward that role, they have allowed me to glimpse their operation and survive. Me. Lonely me. Anxiety-ridden me. <laughs> There's no way I have a role in anything except my own sleeplessness. If I'm important to Bay and Creek, it likely means that I am troublesome to Thistle which would explain, perhaps, why I was targeted so early on in my search by that... creature. But Thistle wouldn't give up just because they missed me once. If I'm important enough for them to target, then I am still a target. Thistle must still be coming for me. And I swear, it was right when I reached that conclusion that I heard the car approaching the abandoned house. There is the other side of constant travel, of course. This sense that you never belong anywhere. Or this forgetfulness about where you've been, or worse, where you are. The franchises amplify this, of course. I stop for lunch in a Chili's because it's there, and there's a lot of room to park my truck. And I look around and realize I don't even know what state I'm in. It's a feeling of bottomlessness, like the floor has disappeared, like a shitty magic trick. I'm falling, but also I'm not. I'm eating a chicken fajita salad in a plastic booth. Beyond that, there is the gap that forms between you and other people. They all are going to be here tomorrow and the day after, and the day after that. Me? I barely know where I'm going to be tomorrow. I have no idea where I'll be next week. I couldn't begin to guess my locations for the year, not even within a 300 mile radius. Romance and sadness have always gone hand in hand, of course. 
and the romance of travel never more so. The bloom of excitement is so quickly replaced by the quiet despair of looking out another motel window at another motel parking lot and the highway on the other side of the tall wire fence. And this knowledge that no matter where you go, it's still you, standing in a room with yourself, looking through the same eyes, thinking the same thoughts. My usual anxiety exploded into panic. I should have run the other direction, but terror pinged around my brain and no thoughts could connect amongst the chatter. Instead, I crawled to the front window. There was a police car, its headlights obscuring any detail except the basic shape of it. It was starting to be quite dark, so I couldn't tell who was inside. The headlight switched off, the door opened, and as it did, the interior light came on. Sitting in the passenger seat was a man in a police uniform. He was dead, with wounds all over his neck and torso. I don't think his death had been quick. Coming out of the driver's seat was a woman I had met once before, on a road near the Salton Sea, and I hoped would never meet again. She was dressed haphazardly in something like a police officer's uniform, but the details were all wrong. Keisha, she shouted. Keisha, you in there? She leaned on the hood. I mean, I know you are, so I guess that was a dumb question. My bad. She brushed off her hands in three quick slaps. I followed you here. You're very easy to follow. I can smell you. She tapped her nose and laughed. I can smell you from three states away. You smell really good. So I guess, uh, take that as a compliment. Okay, I'm gonna come in now. I scrambled up and back toward the kitchen, past the ruined staircase, not stable enough to climb, and anyway, I'm not gonna corner myself. I made it to the back bedroom, a child's bedroom, but now a ruin, like all the rest of the house. I heard the front door open. Why are you poking around this place again? Is there something here for us to find? Movement and clatter as she rooted around the living room and the kitchen. You don't have to answer that. If there's something to find, we'll find it. When faced with a problem, we tear at it and keep tearing and tearing and tearing and eventually everything gives. The window was broken, juts of glass around the frame, but there was no choice. I started to wriggle through it, doing my best to end up with only light scratches. Keisha, it's okay. This doesn't have to be difficult. It's time. Her voice was so close. My legs were caught in the frame and I pulled hard. The glass popped and I fell free. And as I did, she rounded the corner. Her eyes glinted in the darkness. There you are, she said. I was already rising to run, but she didn't sound in any hurry. Hey, listen, I have a job to do now. Here we go. And she leapt forward, her laid-back energy compressing and coiling out in a burst of violent movement. And she was at the window, and her hand as unyielding as a handcuff around my arm. And I took the chunk of glass that had come out with my exit, and I drove it through her chest. She made a soft, involuntary sigh and stepped back, her hand loosening for a moment. I tore away and back toward the front of the house. I'd left my truck a long walk distant to avoid, and this seemed darkly funny to me just then, to avoid attracting attention, and there was no way I was going to make it back there on foot before she caught me. So I went to the cop car, and... Mercy of mercies, she had left the key in the ignition. I fell into the seat and I started the car. 
The cop had been dead for a bit, and the smell was a lot. I tried not to think about his proximity to me, about what any of this meant. I concentrated on the motions. I turned the key, the engine started. Already I was in drive, and on the gas, a sliding, squealing turn back toward the road. As I drove as fast as the car would go on the dirt, I looked behind me and saw in the red light of my escape the woman, glass sticking out of her chest, absolute determination on her face, pumping her arms. And for a moment, I couldn't believe it. She gained on my speeding car. And then a gear change kicked in. And I finally saw her fade into the blue twilight of the just set sun. There's a sense of family that I think forms between people who have to travel a lot for work, no matter what that work is. Corporate suits flying to sales meetings twice a week. A drummer who sits in the back of a van eight months out of the year. People like me driving our trucks. You can recognize the look in the other's eyes, this feeling of having seen too many miles in too short a time. You can compare stories about Cleveland and about Ann Arbor and Birmingham and Fort Lauderdale. They know the romance and they know the despair. And so you don't have to talk about either. You can just ask them how the Hampton Inn is in Madison, Wisconsin, and they'll know exactly what you mean. I started this by lamenting the amorphous nature of my search and well, that's been addressed. All other options have been taken away. Now I know I am being pursued. And so my only way forward is to run. Which direction doesn't matter? What matters is distance. What matters is speed. I wish I could tell you where I am. But even if I could, then what? Alice, our paths are different now, I suppose. You were on your way to saving something bigger than us all. And me? I am only going to be able to save myself, and maybe not even that. Besides, by the time I told you where I was, I would be somewhere else. Just never stop moving. Because she is coming. She is fast behind me. And I cannot even imagine what she would do if she caught up. Bay and Creek wanted me to see what they are, and they wanted me to live to remember it. There is a role for me in defeating the Thistlemen. What that role is, I have no idea. Maybe you knew, Alice. Maybe that was another secret that you kept from me. I only know that I need to live long enough to figure out what my place is in this war. <sighs> More soon, Alice. I hope. Shit. I hope. This episode was brought to you by Audible. Audible has an unmatched selection, including audiobooks, original shows, news, comedy, and more. Audible is offering you a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial. Here's what. Go to audible.com dead. Browse their unmatched selection of content, download a title for free, and start listening. In just a few minutes, you could be listening to that book you've been meaning to try for months. One book you might like is Universal Harvester by John Darneal, songwriter of the Mountain Goats, who also, unfairly, turns out to be a brilliant novelist. A heartbreaking and bone-chilling novel about a video store clerk in late 90s Iowa who starts finding disturbing and inexplicable footage inserted into the tape's return to his store. It's a story that will stick with you for a long time, 
And that long time could start for free right now with a 30-day free trial at audible.com slash dead. That's audible.com slash dead. This episode also brought to you by Blue Apron. Do you think of yourself as someone who doesn't cook? Or do you cook, but you have the five things you make and nothing else? Either way, you could be cooking a whole variety of stuff starting next week without having to go to fancy classes or changing who you are as a person. Blue Apron will send you a box of fresh ingredients from their community of artisanal suppliers, family-run farms, fisheries, and ranchers. And with those ingredients and simple step-by-step recipes, you will create delicious meals all for less than $10 each. Like the creamy Lumaca Regatta pasta. Man, farm fresh asparagus is good. And I blanched them, which is a thing I learned how to do. And then I put goat cheese on top, and then I ate that whole thing because, guys, that was some really good pasta, which I made. You could be the kind of person who blanches asparagus, and you could be that kind of person next week. Just go to blueapron.com slash dead to get your first three meals free with free shipping. That's blueapron.com slash dead. Check out aliceisntdead.com for new t-shirts and hats, including thistle hats and Bay and Creek shirts, so you can show your allegiance. Plus the original beautiful Alice Isn't Dead logo shirts. And follow us on Facebook or Twitter for a little bit of roadside America in your timeline. And now... A knock-knock joke. Knock-knock. Who's there? Who? 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 Like an owl. Get it? Yeah, I get it. You're not going to let me in, are you? No, I'm not. But who would make owl puns for you? I'm going back to bed. Listen, wait. Listen. Yes? There's this brick wall where no two bricks are the same size, within which there's this window with a perfect map of the world and fingerprints, below which there's this heater coughing up the first dust of winter, on top of which there's two jackets, one scarf, three gloves. Anyway, I saw a van flip over on 26th Street, and it reminded me of you. I'm going to bed. Okay. Good night. Good night. This has been a production of Night Vale Presents. Find out more about us and our shows at nightvalepresents.com.